Um, I should explain that this is not going to look like the sort of uh, philosophy of physics talk that you might expect. Uh, it's coming from a quite different perspective from the one that's normally held in the context of philosophy of physics. I've been working lately a lot on theories of inductive inference, and I'm interested in anomalies that pop up, uh, occasions when we need to do things rather differently from the way that they've always been done. And eternal inflation uh, ends up giving us a case of enormous interest uh, from that perspective. Whether it's going to solve problems of eternal inflation or not, uh, that, uh, that I can't say. I don't think the problems in, etern in eternal inflation are going to be that much better off for the analysis that I'm going to give. Maybe they'll be understood a little better as to what the problem is, uh, although uh, I don't think they'll be the kind of solution that uh, cosmologists want. But if you work in inductive inference, I'm hoping you'll find this to be a rather uh, interesting result. So I want to start out just by framing my starting point. Uh, I'm going to go through a, a bit of detail here. I, the, the details are really inessential uh, to, to what follows. I'm going to be talking about, oh, let me get this, sorry, I was, oh, there we go. Um, I want to talk about accounts of inductive inference. I'm not especially interested in any of the details here, but I just want you to get a sense of what accounts of inductive inference over the last few centuries have looked like. I want you to see that there are many different accounts. There isn't just, you know, the philosophical community over the largest time period has not been able to decide on which is the right way to think about inductive inference. So there's a schema here that I produced uh, from doing a bit of a historical survey into theories of inductive inference. I found that over the long period of time, uh, accounts of inductive inference can pretty much all be put into three different families. They, they're labeled here, inductive generalization, hypothetical induction, and probabilistic induction. Each of them is governed by some kind of a principle. This is what makes them work. Inductive generalization is the simplest and the oldest. It just says, when you have an instance of a generalization, you can infer to the generalization. Hypothetical induction puts things on its head. If you have some theory or some hypothesis that entails a truth, then that's a mark of the truth of the hypothesis. Right? Those are fairly clear principles that need obviously need work, but those are the underlying principles. And then there's probabilistic induction. And the idea there, it's fairly crude. It's just, there's a calculus that's gonna cover all this. Don't worry, folks, we'll use a calculus. It'll make everything work. So each of these has an archetypal form. And I've listed them here, enumerative induction, saving the phenomena, um, probabilities and games of chance. None of them have the scope that you would want. All of them have problems of various different types. And this has spawned a plethora of different accounts of, of inductive inference. Uh, I've indicated some of them here. I don't want to go through them. This is just the framing of the problem that I'm working on. How is it you know, that something as simple as what is the relationship between evidence in science and the theories that are supported by it, why is it that we have this flood of, of, uh, of, 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 of different ideas? And that, that's what I've been working on, trying to understand how that comes about and to see if there's some way we can get a uh, better grip on that. Uh, now, the key, uh, the, the key result that, uh, that I've come to is that none of these accounts succeeds universally. They're all in competition. Each one is saying, I've got the right way to think about things, and they're all wrong, right? Uh, they all work in different places. You know, pick your favorite account. Um, it's going to work in this case, but it won't work over there. Or, or the competitor will work over there, but it, won't, but it won't, won't work here. So I'll just mention that Bayesian analysis is presently the most popular account of inductive inference in science. If you look at the history, this is a, um, uh, a momentary thing. Uh, the Bayesian analysis has only uh, risen within the last few decades. When I entered philosophy of science in the early 1980s, it was all Hempel and, and Ravens and, uh, and in effect, um, um, uh, instance justification, uh, instance um, confirmation. So if, you've, if you're unfamiliar with this literature, let me just give you one example of a very different account of inductive inference that's actually pertinent to, what, to, to the, the case at hand. And this is inference to the best explanation. Uh, at the heart of the origin 
of inflationary cosmology towards the end of the 20th century was in inference the best explanation. Guth and others who were supporting the idea of inflationary cosmology said, look, we have these weird things. There's the flatness problem, the homogeneity problem, the absence of magnetic mono monopoles. And, you know, and then as work continued, um, uh, there was a, a need to get the right spectrum of density fluctuations to have structure formation. All of this at one time or another, it said is best explained by inflationary cosmology, right? So I've just said they're explained by inflationary cosmology. Now comes the adaptive move. Therefore, inflationary cosmology is the right, um, uh, is the right account. Just to give you a sense that, that in our neighborhood already, there are different accounts of inductive inference at, at work here. None of the people who were working on this gave probabilities for this. Right? This was just the way the argument went. They didn't say, therefore, with probability 0.95, dot, dot, dot. OK, now my focus is not inference the best explanation. Uh, my focus is the idea that's underlying the contemporary literature, literature in Bayesianism. It's this idea that inductive inference simply is probabilistic reasoning, right? There's, an, there's, a, there's a, a complete capture there. Um, all inductive inference when done properly is probabilistic reasoning. Probabilistic reasoning is the norm against which you judge uh, any inductive inference. Uh, um, uh, someone who thinks this way would look at the inference the best explanation that I just gave you a moment ago and say yes, and in turn, it's really a probabilistic inference and let me show you how and then they'll fill you up with uh, um, outcome spaces and likelihoods and priors and so on and say see. Right? Okay, so that's my reaction to it. No, not always. Right? I think there are cases where probabilistic inference just is not the right thing to apply. And so I've been hunting around for what these cases might look like. But let me pursue the thought just a little more. Um, I, I have a map here of the entire terrain of, uh, of, of, of the space of, of probabilistic inferences. Here's the, here's the map, right? And uh, the claim is the following. If you visit one part of this map, uh, you'll find the probabilistic inference works in that particular corner. But if you go to another part, there'll be something else. And if you go to another part, something else, and then something else, and then something else. So as you pass between these different domains, you're going to be asking, how do I know where I am? What decides where the borders are? What decides when a different uh, uh, approach to inductive inference is going to be used? Uh, so that's the question. What determines which logic goes where? Uh, uh, and my answer to the question is background facts. If you look at the background facts that are pertinent in the relative domain, they are going to fix uh, what the uh, appropriate inductive logic is. So one of the things that, that I've been doing to, uh, to develop this view is to look for cases where the background facts are such that we get directed to something other than a probabilistic um, uh, approach to inductive inference. And uh, as you can guess, uh, that's what the measure problem in inflationary cosmology does for me. That's my interest in it. It's one of these cases where we can look at the physics that's involved and say, oh, this is a case where the background facts are telling us that probabilistic analysis is not the right one to use, but those same background facts are telling us which is the right one to use. So that's the content of the talk. I'm now going to uh, elaborate that particular uh, set of conclusions. Why is it that in the measure problem, probabilities are uh, inappropriate? And why do the background facts of, of, um, of, of the measure problem tell us that some other uh, inductive uh, mode is the appropriate one? Uh, for completeness, let me just briefly go through what the measure problem is. Um, I'm sure you all know it, but uh, it's just helpful to, to see it again. Uh, the way things work in inflationary cosmology is that we assume that the universe on the largest scale is perpetually involved uh, in, a, in an exponential expansion of, uh, of inflation, right? It is everywhere expanding um, exponentially, right? And uh, as it expands, uh, if the world were just pure, purely classical, uh, nothing terribly much would be happening. But because of quantum fluctuations within the expansion process, uh, every now and again, uh, a classical non-inflating universe, well, not classical, but a non-inflating universe uh, gets spawned, right? So this is the blue square here, a blue rectangle is a moment in, 
in the expansion, showing the small section, and these little balls represent ordinary universes, maybe like the one that we're in uh, that, uh, that, that has been spawned here. The, one that, the ones that we're in are not un undergoing this massive inflation uh, because uh, that doesn't permit things like uh, formation and structure and so on. You, you have difficulty. So as the universe expands, more and more of these universes are being spawned. Right? Now I've, I've um, colored them uh, red and blue and I put numbers on them for a particular reason. This is a standard part of the way that the problem is being, uh, is being set up. One of the things that uh, we'd like to know in internal uh, inflation is what these universes are like. What sorts of properties do they have? They'll have various values of the fundamental constants. Uh, are they giving us values of the fundamental constants and other aspects that are like our universe, right? The one that we see or that are unlike it, right? So, um, so I've, I've labeled the red ones uh, as uh, like ours uh, and the blue ones as as unlike ours. Now, the theory says that there are an accountable, a, accountable infinity of all of these different ones. So there's an accountable infinity of like uh, universes, one, uh, uh, pocket universes that are being spawned that are like ours, uh, and accountable infinity that's unlike ours. So what we would like to be able to say is that it's very probable that a universe like ours is going to be produced in this process. Right? We'd like to say that because that would then make the scenario of internal inflation look very much stronger. Uh, we, could, we could then say, here's the scenario of internal inflation and it's going to give us universes just like ours, which is what we see. This would be a good thing. Right? Now, the difficulty is how to secure that it is very likely that pro um, uh, judgment. That's the uh, that's the measure problem, and it's set up in the following way. What is the probability that a, a pocket universe is like our universe? And the result you would want is really high, right? Or 50-50 or something. You, you wouldn't want it to be very, very improbable because then you have to fall back on saying, well, our universe is very unlikely that it happened. We'll have a look around, here we are. Right. So uh, the difficulty is, uh, this can't be made to work. Uh, the measure problem, uh, this is the earlier statement of, I think I found this is in Guth from about 2000. Uh, the difficulty is what you already saw in the picture earlier on, I, I guess I won't read the quote to you because it, you know, that's boring. Um, the, the basic problem is you have a countable infinity of universes that are like ours and a countable infinity of universes that are unlike ours. I should mention, of course, the division between like and unlike is, is arbitrary, but it doesn't really matter for the, for the analysis. You could pick any range of parameter values to, to declare that to be likely. Now, the difficulty when you have an infinity that's like ours and an infinity that's unlike ours, you would want to form probabilities by taking ratios, right? But the difficulty is that a ratio of an infinity to, to an infinity um, is a meaningless ratio. Here, I'm now, I'm now reading the Perhaps I'll just read the highlighted sentence. The fraction of universes with any particular property is therefore equal to infinity divided by infinity, a meaningless ratio, right? Um, and so you know, what, what, what are we gonna do with that? Um, regularization, in other words, finding some correct sequence to take the limit uh, is the solution that one would want, but there is no easy way to do that. Okay, so, um, um, I just thought I'd clip out the bit of text, you know, you know, screenshot just from the just from the um, uh, from the passage, so you can see, uh, you know, that this is the way that Goof is setting it up, and and the example that I'm going to, oops, go back one. The example I'm going to talk about uh, is his example here. So I'm not I'm not cooking up this example. This is the example that Goof has used, and it's the one that has become standard in all of the later. Uh, discussion of the measure problem. It, it has variant forms. Uh, Steinhardt doesn't use numbers like this. He uses nickels and dimes, I think different coins. Um, now, at this point, I, I should say, it is a good question as to whether this framing of the problem is the appropriate framing of the problem. And we can certainly talk about that. That gets a bit outside of the area that I, that I have um, deep expertise. Um, uh, my project is to take this framing and then ask where where we go uh, where we go with it. 
So what is the uh, problem? I'm calling it the counting problem. What is the counting problem uh, that Guth is, is describing here? Uh, these are the numbers that we had on the universes. Uh, the red ones were like ours, the blue ones were unlike ours. And when you just list out the numbers like that, you want to say, oh, okay, that's, that's pretty easy. Then uh, um, it looks like half of the numbers are odd. So half of the universes are like ours. We seem to be getting a probability of a half out of that. That's really very nice. Um, more precisely, you would take a limit as you move along the sequence. But, but if you, you know, pay attention to the way that limit works, the order in which you put those numbers down or the order in which you count the universes uh, is going to determine what the final ratio is. And, uh, um, and, and Guth says, that's the problem. Guth says, I can just arrange these numbers differently. This was the little screenshot that I showed you. I can arrange them so we have two odd numbers followed by an even number, two odd numbers followed by an even number. That sequence is going to pick up all of the, all of the universes. You know, every even number, every odd number of the universe is going to appear somewhere in the sequence. But exactly the same thinking that we had before uh, is going to give us the result uh, that um, the probability of a universe like ours is two thirds. And by adjusting things any way you like, you can get any probability out of that you, uh, that you want. So the conclusion then is the probability uh, that is the probability of an odd or the probability of the universe like ours just cannot be defined. Uh, we're in trouble. Now, what, what, is the, what is the nature of the trouble? The nature of the trouble is that prediction is impossible. Right? Now, it's a, very, it's a very dire conclusion. Right? The idea is that the apparatus that we have for making predictions, the apparatus that we have for assessing the uncertainties that are involved here, it has failed. Right? It's a failure of our theoretical uh, uh, treatment of of the uncertainties that are involved in these in these universes. Um, uh, so it's pretty uncompromising what Guth says, to extract predictions from the theory, we must therefore learn to distinguish the probable from the improbable. So it's gonna be talked of in terms of probability, but probably how, how do you get probability to, to apply here? So if you, are, if you are in the Guth camp, right, then um, uh, this is an interesting research project, and you're going to try and find ways to regularize, to find a regulator for the, uh, for the, for the sequences. If you've been following this literature, you'll know uh, that, that there are many different ways you can do that. All of them have trouble. They lead to different results. You get things like the youngest problem, all, all sorts of issues. It, it just never goes to any, any definite result. So that, that's what it looks like on one side of this debate. If you go to the other side of the debate, you're someone like um, Steinhardt and his collaborators uh, who, who think there's something very wrong with the whole idea of in, inflationary cosmology and they are stark critics of it. If you've been following the debates here, they've, they've really been debating um, in the popular literature. Oh, a few years ago, there was a big Scientific American uh, debate on this. There are angry letters being written to editors. It's, it, it's really gotten quite, uh, quite heated. From that perspective, uh, then uh, this is simply a symptom of failure, right? It makes no sense whatever to talk about predictions, right? You just, you know, Guth's quoted it and then you say, look, prediction has just completely failed. All right, what have I got to offer to, to this, right? Well, I want to reorient the thinking here. I just, I want to say probabilistic prediction is impossible, right? Because that's the wrong logic. We've now moved in my little figure, away from a domain where probabilistic um, inductive inference applies, we've moved over to a new domain, right, where it, it doesn't apply, right? And the background facts that are telling you that are precisely the ones that Guth has been talking about. Those are the background facts that tell you uh, what an appropriate logic should, should, uh, should look like. Um, now, when I, I, I wasn't aware of the details of this. I'd heard about the measure problem, but never thought much about it. Um, uh, um, but I wasn't aware of this while I was writing some of the chapters of the book that, uh, that Antonio so kindly appetized for me. Um, uh, and and I, came, I came across a rather odd non-probabilistic logic. And I was delighted to find it turns out to be the one that applies here. So uh, let me tell you about what this logic is. It's weird, but it's the one that applies. Uh, as you'll see when I start to go, go through the cases. Uh, this is the logic that applies if you're working 
not with an ordinary lot, uh, lottery machine, but an infinite lottery machine. So infinite lottery machine figuratively looks something like this. You have a countable infinity of balls, numbered one, two, three, all the way through, right? And we're going to pick one of those, one of those, uh, one of those balls fairly without, without favoring uh, any of the numbers, right? Just the way a lottery works, except instead of having a finite um, urn full of balls, you have an infinite urn. And we're going to pick without favoring um, any particular um, um, uh, ball. Now, you, you might think, yeah, okay, what, what can go wrong, right? Yeah, well, stick around, you'll see what can, uh, what can go wrong. Uh, the issue is to decide what we mean by choosing without favor. There has to be some sort of definition of that. And the definition I'm, I'm offering, uh, this is what I take it we mean when we say without favor, that is that permuting the labels on the balls isn't going to make any difference uh, to the chances of the outcomes, right? So this, this numbering that we have here uh, is arbitrary, and we could have used any other number, any other numbering, and it wouldn't make a difference. We can ask, what's the chance of getting 27? It wouldn't make a difference which ball 27 is attached to. It's always going to be the same chance. Now, I've used the word chance here, uh, and I should emphasize that at the moment, it's a vague idea. Um, all we're going to see is it's not probabilistic. We can't assume that chance here is identified with probability. It could be some other notion, and I will argue that it is another notion, and my job now is to try and figure out what is, what is this notion. Um, I want to say just a little more about choosing without favor, just to make sure you... Uh, you realize that this is the, uh, this is, you know, because this is the driving fact, right? Um, um, you know, the label independence that I just described is the, is an analog of what Guth is working with when he, re, when he reorder, reorders the, uh, um, uh, the, the numbers representing um, his, uh, his pocket universes. Um, so the, the direct assertion is that all true statements pertinent, the chances of different outcomes remain true when the labels are arbitrarily permuted. I mean a permutation in the mathematical sense, right? So it means it's a, it's a, it's a one one mapping such that be, you know, every number has a destination. Uh, you, you never get a destination that has two numbers piled on them and nothing gets left out. I mean, you know, the definition of permutation. I mean that, uh, I, I mean that, I, do, I don't just mean jumbling about. So why is that reasonable? Well. Let's just, just take the case of this is a randomizer that has, uh, that has uh, four numbers on it and you, sp you spin the dial uh, and you ask, well, is this a, is this a fair randomizer? Well, uh, you can't really tell from just, just looking at it because it might well be that it's held vertically and the, and the head of the arrow always points down. Uh, but if I tell you, yeah, it's fair because we find that it doesn't matter where you put the numbers on the, on the dial, uh, the chances of getting the different numbers always remain the same. So the chance of having a one or a two is going to be the same here as if we pulled off the numbers and stuck them back on in a different order like this, or if we pulled them off and stuck them back on uh, in, a, in, a different, uh, in a different order like that. Okay, so um, I think we can then move on. Uh, let's now apply this criterion to the balls that are coming out of the... Uh, uh, out of the infinite lottery machine, or if you like, to the um, um, uh, to the universes in Guth's uh, uh, example, we have the odd numbered balls and we have the even numbered balls. Uh, the uh, the chance of, of the set of odd numbered balls uh, is going to you know the red balls, in other words, is going to be independent of the labels that we apply to them. So if we switch the labels around, oh sorry, I, I, I should I should say at the moment we don't know. Um, what the relative chance of odd and even is. There are three possibilities. Um, odd might have greater chance than even, odd might have less chance than even, or odd might have the same chances even. So let's apply this condition of label independence and, and start switching the labels around and see what we can do. So we'll take the labels from uh, the red balls, the odd numbered labels from the red balls and switch them with the even numbered uh, 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 labels from the blue balls. We've now switched them over. Um, uh, the switching of labels has no effect on the chance of the, uh, of the outcome. And so it's immediately clear uh, that each of these uh, possibilities are ruled out because they're not invariant under label permutation. And so the only one that's left is that the chance of odd is equal to the chance of even. A very comfortable result. It's kind of what you expect. Yeah, okay, so what's the point? Well, 
Um, here's, the, here's the point. We could have switched the labels around in other ways. And I'll show you just a different way of switching things around to give you, give you a sense. This is Guth's construction, but I'm going to lay it out figuratively. So we have the odd set and the even set. I'm going to make a little bit of space here. And, and I hope you will be impressed at my great facility with PowerPoint here. This is one of the high points of my PowerPoint achievement. So please, you know, feel free to admire. Okay. All right. So we're going to move the three down here and we're going to move the five over and seven down here and the nine over. And then we're going to fill in, fill in the gaps. Now, you know, we, we still have all of the balls there. The dot, dot, dots have got the ellipses, have got, all the, have got all the rest of them. But if we now apply exactly the sort of reasoning that we had before, we're going to switch the labels between the rows. I won't, I won't go through the details of how that happens because the result's kind of obvious. Right? Um, uh, we're, we're going to get results for what I'm labeling here as odd sub one, odd sub two, and, uh, and even. These are the labels of the rows that, uh, that you see here. Uh, we're going to get that each, each of those rows has an equal chance, right, just by the label permutation. But we know from earlier, from the screen earlier, the one that was untroubling, that the chance of even is the same as the chance of odd. Uh, but we also know that the chance of odd is the chance of the disjunction of odd or even. And if you just stare at that, right, you'll see pretty quickly uh, that we have a failure of additivity at the simplest level. Those of you who have had the pleasure of playing around with infinite lottery machines uh, will, will know that uh, the infinite lottery machine is the standard example that's used to, uh, 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 to argue for the abandoning of countable additivity for a probability measure. Well, what I've just shown you that it is that it isn't just countable additivity that has to go if you're dealing with these infinite lottery machines. It's the very simplest finite additivity. Even just two cases like this, the additivity uh, is, is going to fail. Okay, label independence is the background fact. It's an invariance. I think we're all used to in physics how invariances give you, you know, you just crank out results from invariances. So let me just start cranking the handle and, you know, and, and see what, the, what this label uh, independence is, is, is going to give us. Uh, now, the key thing here is to understand which sets of outcomes are going to be equivalent under label and independence. So they're going to be the equal chance um, outcome sets. So if you have a set that has three members in it, it could be one, two, and three, or 27, five, and 134, or, or any, anyone with just three members in it, uh, they are all gonna be the same under permutation because you can permute the labels so that the one turns into the other. So all three membered sets, are going to have the uh, uh, are going to have the same chance because they are uh, equivalent under label independence. So in general, then we have uh, sets of finite n, right? So if you have finite sub 100, this will be a set that has 100 uh, numbers in it, and uh, that has the same chance as any other set that has 100 numbers in it. Right? That's that that's one set. Now the biggest set, by far the uh, or by far the set that exhausts everything is one set it's infinite co-infinite this is the set of uh, this is the set of outcomes such that the outcome of interest is countably infinite and its complement is also countably infinite the example that's familiar is odd numbers the odd numbers are countably infinite the complement the even numbers are countably infinite but instead of odd numbers we could have had prime numbers right the prime numbers are countably infinite and the composite numbers, their complement, uh, are countably infinite. So you can see with, you know, with a, a little bit more fuss, um, we can relabel all the odd numbers to be, um, um, uh, to be prime numbers, and we can relabel all the even numbers to be composite numbers. Uh, and so we're gonna get um, um, the equality of chances there. So any set that is infinite and co-infinite is gonna come out as, um, uh, as having equal chances. And then finally, at the other end, we have infinite sets whose complements are finite. So this would be sets of all numbers excluding any three. Right? I think that's fairly, fairly straightforward. It's just the mirror image of the, of the finite n, n case. So that's actually told us a lot about what our logic is. This is really fixing the logic. 
all that um, all that remains now is, is just to write it down. Right? Each one of these sets uh, are, equal, are equal chance sets. So uh, the chance of a uh, 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 of a set that, that is finite n, well, I'm just going to write as vn, v sub n. This is a, you know, this is a uh, purely notational thing on this page or something else being added here. So if you ask me what is the chance of the set one, two, three, I'll say, oh, it's v sub three. What is the chance of the set uh, 10, 20, 30? I'll say, oh, v sub three. Or if you ask me what is the chance of um, uh, a square number, I'll say, oh, it's V infinity because the square, the set of square numbers uh, is, uh, is uh, infinite uh, co-infinite and correspondingly all the way through. And so V minus N here has a similar meaning for the infinite co-finite uh, sets. Just, just to keep the notation going. Oh, so yes, yeah, so um, uh, how are we to think of these? Well, I think it's fairly easy to see the way that we can think of these. Um, there's an uncountable infinity of these guys, and these are all countably infinite, if I remember correctly, something like that. Uh, so uh, we're going to say in a very strong sense, uh, if something comes out to be V3, it is unlikely. So you've got an infinite lottery machine. What is the chance that you'll get a one or two or a three? Well, you're gonna say, well, one or two or three, look at all the others, infinitely many other choices, it's, it's, it's really unlikely. Huh? Then what are we gonna say about um, um, infinite uh, co-infinite, this v, infin v infinity? Well, the best we can say is it's as likely as not, because pick any one of these sets, you know, the odd num an odd numbered set is, li is as likely as an even numbered set, but then since we can relabel them any way that we like, um, you're gonna get every, uh, infinite uh, co-infinite set is as likely as, as every other, which is, I, I hope you realize this is highly non-intuitive, right? But this is what the assumptions are giving us. Right? This is, you take what you get. And then correspondingly here, what's the chance of, of, of getting something that is not one, two or three? Answer, very likely, right? So likely in a very, very uh, strong sense. Okay, and then I just fill in some other things here. Let's just write V sub zero for the empty set, which is certainly not, and V sub minus one for all outcomes. Corresponds to zero and one roughly in probability theory, I guess. Okay, so um, there's a piece that I've added down here. Uh, all we have now are the equalities amongst the chances, but I'm going to suggest that it's a natural extension if you want to do it. Right, to say that the chance of a finite set is less than the chance of an infinite set, which is less than the chance of an infinite um, co-finite co set. So I've put in these less thans. We, strictly speaking, need more background facts in order to establish that that is the case. Um, and so these are then assigned the values that you, uh, uh, that you, that you see here. Okay, good. So um, I've introduced you to a new logic. And uh, um, if you're seeing it for the second time, yeah, you've got it, okay, no big deal. If you're seeing it for the first time, it's kind of helpful just to think out a few cases because it, it kind of goes in weird ways you don't really expect in case you hadn't already noticed that. So here's just a simple puzzle. Uh, we have all of, these, all of these outcomes laid out for us and we're interested in what is the chance of getting a number when the machine runs that is less than or equal to n, right? We're gonna make n uh, as big as you like. I mean, to, to get a real sense of what's going on here, um, think of the biggest number you can possibly think of, the biggest finite number, and then think of a bigger one, and then a bigger one, and then a bigger one. And whatever number you think of can be, can be n here, right? What are the chances that the machine is gonna produce a number that is less than or equal to the one that you're, uh, that you're thinking of? Well, um, it's gonna be chance V sub N, which is the unlikely, the does not happen set. So no matter how big you, you thought the number to be, you're always gonna be disappointed. You should not expect that, that, uh, that number to be there. Uh, it's uh, uh, what will happen is, is always greater, right? Not terribly surprising when you think about the, the, the structure that's, in, uh, that's involved here. Uh, this one is a little less obvious. Uh, let's say we have a thousand of these machines all lined up and we have a thousand independent drawings, right? And we're gonna ask, what's the chance that all thousand numbers are less than or equal to the N that you thought of? Okay, you now know that's not terribly likely, uh, but what about 
we'll compare that to all thousand numbers are going to be this exactly the same number, right? Um, um, you know, if if your intuitions are tutored in probability theory, right, you're going to have the second one as being uh, uh, less likely than the first one. But when you, you know, this is a calculation for another day. But when you go through it, you discover uh, that. Um, uh, that the chance of the first one is in the unlikely category, it's V sub something finite, whereas the chance of the other one is V sub infinity, because there are infinitely many ways that this can happen. And infinitely many ways for it to happen is all that's, all that's needed for this to be boosted to the, uh, to the higher level. Okay, so let's now apply this to uh, the, uh, the problem of internal inflation. In this logic, what is the chance that the universe uh, is like ours compared to the chance that the universe is unlike ours. Well, they're equal, right? Um, uh, or to put it in informal terms, it's, um, they are as likely as not, right? Um, but I think you can see this is not an especially helpful gift if you're interested in prediction, uh, because the chance of a, a level of V infinity covers so many cases that intuitively don't look like what we're looking for. So the only point is, um, the laments, right? The laments about, oh, probability fails here. What can we do, right? I want to replace that by saying, um, you need to understand what the problem is. You've entered a domain where a different inductive logic applies, right? And, uh, and that's what you're hit with. You're, you're hit with a non-standard uh, in, in, in inductive logic. It's not a lack of imagination that you haven't thought about this hard enough to see how you can combine all of, all of these infinities. Now, um, I've been talking about this these stuff in various venues for a while, and I kind of know the reaction. It's the reaction that, that, that I first had as well. Um, yeah, but aren't you underselling things here, right? Okay, I understand what your logic gives you. Let's, but what happens if we go empirical? Um, just let's get together a large number of these lottery machines, right? And they're all laid out in a big table, you know, very large numbers, a hundred, a million, a hundred million, right? And, and let's run them, right? Aren't we going to find out when we do, when we run them, that um, we're going to get roughly um, equal frequencies of odd and even, or if we get something different, we'll at least have an answer that's better than V infinity, which doesn't seem to be telling us very much. So, you know, we're sort of thinking here, you might get a two, that's an even outcome, it's an odd outcome, it's another even outcome, odd outcome, even, odd, and blah, blah, blah. Okay. Well, uh, how do you handle a situation like this? Well, we come up with situations like this in the probability calculus as well. And the answer is always to say, well, what does the calculus tell us? Right. What is the calculus, the probability calculus going to tell us in, in cases like this? And then you grind through and very often you get a result that naively you might not have expected. So I, I thought I'd try and recreate the idea of running infinitely many, sorry, finitely many, a large number of these, uh, of, uh, of the, of these machines uh, in order to see if we can get stabilizing frequencies. Notice the key thing, you only want a finite number of them. If you have an infinity of them, then you're back to the original problem, right? Um, so uh, so here, here's the uh, uh, inflationary uh, uh, universe again, and here are the uh, odd and even numbers or the like and unlike universes. To simulate there being n infinite uh, uh, lottery machines, let's divide that um, the sectors up into into n sectors. n is very large, but necessarily finite, so we can do the so we can do the analysis. Uh, and uh, then the analog of running the infinite lottery machine is to ask after the chance of getting a particular outcome uh, in, uh, uh, in 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 each particular case. So you know, so so this is the one that that might be picked on the. No, I'm sorry, you can't see my finger pointing, can you? Or if you can. Um, I want to know how you're doing it. <laughs> um, so, so here's the one picked here, here's the one picked here, here's the one picked here, and so on and so on. You know, using the infinite lottery logic rules of, of, um, of, 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 of label independence. And what you're hoping to happen is that roughly half the time you're going to get a red and roughly half the time you're going to get a blue and that'll settle things and it's all done. Right? That's, that's what you're hoping. But uh, that... Um, um, uh, and so, so to cash that out, that's what that looks like here on the screen here. If the probability of getting an even number is a half, 
then roughly one in two of the many drawings that we just saw would come out to be even or, or blue in, this, in the case of the colors, or let's, let's take another outcome that's very, very different from even. Uh, what's the probability of getting a number that is a 100th? That is, it, it belongs to the set 100, 200, 300, 400, dot, 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 dot. Uh, well, if that were the case, then what you would expect in the frequencies is that with very high probability, you'll get roughly one in 100. So for a large N, you're expecting the frequencies to start massing in different places. If the probability is a half, you're expecting the frequency to start massing around, uh, around half of the outcomes being, uh, uh, um, uh, being even. Um, if this probability of 100, um, you're expecting the probability of getting 100 is going to mass around, uh, uh, around 1 in 100. Now, the difficulty is that even and 100 are both in infinite co-infinite sets. So you can map one onto the other, right? And once you see you can map one onto the other, uh, it's then not terribly hard to see, you've got to maybe grind through a bit of calculation here. It's not terribly hard to see uh, what the chances are. You can just go through the whole list. The chance of getting no evens in end draws is the chance of getting zero hundredths in end draws, or the chance of getting one even in end draws is the chance of getting one hundredth. And you just go all the way down the list like that. The chance of getting any particular number of evens in end draws is the same chance as getting any particular number of, of one hundredths. So what that means is that a massing that can distinguish between different probabilities is just not possible, right? If you, um, if you assume that you'll get some sort of massing of chances that will tell you that, um, that roughly half the draws will be even, uh, that same massing of chances will then tell you that roughly half the draws will be one hundredths. And it doesn't take much insight into probability calculus to see that these are incompatible requirements. So you just, you just can't get the probability uh, calculus to work here. So uh, what's, what's, going, what's going on here? Let me try a simple, uh, simple analogy. The calculus is telling you the best that you can get uh, is that we have like and unlike with uh, uh, with, with, with equal chance in the sense of an infinite lottery logic. You might want to hang in there and say, no, 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 the frequencies are going to do it, the frequencies are going to do it. But you're now behaving like someone in a casino committing the gambler's fallacy. Someone in a casino says, yeah, I know what the probability stuff says, but I'm watching this, I'm watching this roulette wheel. I'm counting, I'm counting the rolls, and I'm sure there's some kind of pattern here over successive rolls that I'll be able to figure out and I can you know, I can predict what the next what the next role is going to be. No, you you know, you want to say to them, look, you know, this is the probability calculus. You know, you know how the machine's set up. It's set up so that the roles are all independent. They they demonstrate that for you very clearly in the design of the machine. It's the whole point of it. Um, you know, give up. This is not going to work. Same thing to someone who says, oh, I want to use frequencies to get out of this infinite lottery logic. No, you're just ignoring what the logic is telling you. Okay. So I take it now the exercise is a little different. How are we to think about these infinite lottery chances? Uh, what I'm urging is this, for a case like this, you're gonna to have to retrain your intuitions to start thinking about chances differently, because this is a domain in which a different sense of chance uh, 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 it, it, it is applying. And so I wanna, I wanna look at how we do that uh, in other cases. Uh, you might think that the easy case is the probability calculus. Everyone knows what probabilities are. Well, it's actually the hard case probabilities, right? Um, so let me talk you through at least how I see an understanding of probabilities. Here's the probability scale from zero to one. Stuff that's very close to one, I get. If something has a probability very close to one, then FAP for all practice, practical purposes, a acronym often used now in philosophy of physics, thanks, I think, to uh, John Bell. Right? Um, it will occur, right? Or if we have a probability that's near zero, for all practical purposes, it won't occur, right? You know, we run our lives with stuff like this. This is sometimes called Corno's principle, by the way, if you want to. It has a pedigree in, in history of, of, of philosophy. But what do we do with the intermediate values? Um, exactly how are we to understand the difference between a probability of 0.5 and 0.6? Well, I guess the 0.6 is bigger, but how do I, you know, how much bigger? Well. It's 20% bigger, but what does 20% bigger mean? I, you know, I don't know. How do we handle that? Well, I'll tell you how I handle it. 
What I do is I try and convert those judgments into one of the two that I already understand, right? So I say to myself, oh, probably 0.5. Well, what that means if we were, were to repeat the scenario very many times, then with probably near one, about 50% of the trials would be successes, right? So I, I use the law of large numbers to turn the probability of half case into something I can understand using Cornell's principle. And that then enables me also to distinguish it from the probability of 0.6 case. Very many re repetitions I'll get uh, uh, roughly 60% of successes in the, in the trials. Now, this is the hard case because I had to go through all this folder R to get, you know, to get, us, uh, uh, you know, to get the interpretation to work out. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. This is the uh, easy case in the, in the infinite lottery. Uh, if you have um, one of these V the, uh, uh, sub um, minus finite number, uh, then almost certainly it will occur because it can occur in a countable infinity of ways and only fail in finitely many ways. So yeah, it's going to occur. Uh, at the other end, um, it most likely will not occur because it can only happen in a finite number of ways, whereas it can fail in infinitely many ways. And then in between, uh, it can come about in as many ways as it fails. So it is as... Uh, uh, as, as, as likely as, as not. So sort of winding down a bit here, I know I'm coming to the end of time, so I want to, want to sort of, I want to keep moving along here. There's, a, there's another technique that we can use. It's, it's the same idea of how you get comfortable with this. So a little fable, uh, friends of yours are expecting for the first time, right? And, uh, and uh, you're, you're joining in the celebration, they're terribly happy, and you say to them that the probability that your unborn child will be a girl is 0.5 and they are looking at you blankly completely blankly and then you realize oh wait a minute they're english majors right um they probably never had a course in probability and if they did they probably didn't know what was going on and and so you know you start to kind of feel that how am i going to explain to them uh what that means now then maybe they'll say um so that means that if we have 100 children 50 of them will be girls right and you want to say, no, it doesn't mean that. 50 of them won't, won't be, well, it could be, but they won't be. Um, um, uh, and they say back to you, but in any case, I don't care. We aren't having a hundred children. We've only got one, right? I mean, are you telling me that it'll be half girl and half boy? What are you telling me? You're going to get frustrated over this, but you'll try and be kind, right? And so eventually, aha, you're going to say, it's just, it's like a coin toss. You know what it is to toss a, toss a coin, toss a coin, right? And they're probably getting a heads. Whatever you think about that is what you should think about this, right? So this is a techn technique of benchmarking with a randomizer, okay? And that, that gives you, and that's the way we think about it, right? So let's then apply that to the case of hand. The chance that an eternal, that, that eternal inflation spawns a pocket universe just like ours it's as likely as not. And with good justice, you say to me, well, what does that mean, right? And I answer, well, it's just the same as the chance of drawing an even number in an infinite lottery machine. Whatever you think about that, that's the case that you, uh, that you, that you have at hand, okay? So um, I'm guessing you've all probably heard enough and you're thinking, oh, phew, I'm glad, I'm glad that's over. In case some of you are not thinking that, there is a paper you can read, right? Um, and you can get it on my website. So you just go to my website and Google a little bit, you'll, you'll get to it. This came out in Synthesis a little while ago. Um, it has, I think, pretty much everything I've said here and, uh, and a great deal more. So if you want more details, they're there. And, uh, and if you want to understand um, a little bit more about these infinite lottery logics, please go to my book, Material Theory of Induction. Uh, it's... Um, <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's being published under a new publishing house, BSPS Open, which I'll advertise just briefly, if I may. BSPS Open uh, is a is an open access publishing house uh, with no author fees that is endorsed by the British Society for Philosophy of Science. The hope is to open up open access monograph publishing to the community of, of philosophers of science without needing them to have huge um, uh, author fees, because you know philosophers of science don't. Uh, you know, are commonly not grant driven, so don't have the wherewithal to provide these uh, author fees. 
So I, I commend it to you. Um, I've enjoyed publishing with them. It's been they've been great. One of the one of my best publishing experiences. In fact, a terrific public, a terrific uh, copy editor. So chapter thirteen is all about infant lottery machines, and it's a great deal more there exploring the um, the mechanics of of, of the uh, of the logic that follows. Okay, thanks very much. That's it. First in line, we have Jacob. Please go ahead. Thanks so much. Uh, hi, John. That was a really great talk. Thanks again. Um, I have first a, a, a not very serious and hopefully instantaneous question. Um, you mentioned Carnot's principle. Is that, did I, did I say that right? Is that Carnot like? No, no, it's, it's, it's Cornot, C-O-U-R-N-O-T. Uh, it's, it's talked about um, in only a few places. I got it from a footnote in Glenn Schaefer's work. Uh, I've tried to track it down. Um, uh, and uh, Corno was writing, I think, in the early 18th century in French, and I, you know, I, I poked about in it, and I couldn't actually find him saying exactly what I wanted him to say, but uh, Glenn Schaefer says it, so um, uh, I'm pretty sure there's a reference to it in, in, in one of my chapters somewhere, so, so the trick would be go to the Material Theory of Induction book and do a word search on Corno, and you'll, you'll get it. C O U R N O T. N O yeah, yeah. Because I, I feel like I'm I'm definitely not the only person who's uh, used that principle in like my writing and my in my my lectures and and didn't think anyone else had a name attached to it. Yeah, no. This is a this is a really interesting issue because we take it as trivial that everyone understands probability and we know what we're talking about. But if you actually look at the literature, it is it is an amazing mess. Right. Um, uh, when push comes to shove, I don't think any two people agree on exactly what probability is. You know, we've got the basic outlines. There's a there's a subjective notion and there's an objective notion. But even then, things start to get muddy. So I, actually, my my other question is is my more serious question. Um, uh, it's a slightly critical question. I hope I, I I can ask a somewhat critical question. But so our standard theory of probability. Uh, you, however you want to think about it, based on the Kolmogorov axioms, whatever, whatever version of probability you want to use, it's abstracted from, uh, you know, human experience. It's abstracted from uh, empirical experience, and we're, we're limited human beings, we're finite human beings, and we have access to finite amounts of data. So, you know, a probability theory is, is built on experience with finite cases. Um, here you're considering a hypothetically infinite case. Uh, and I guess I, I'm, I, I'm not clear on, you know, whether it's coherent to proceed here. Uh, and I think, um, you know, the case that I think you're making is there is uh, a form of, of inductive logic that we should apply. It's different from the probability calculus. We have different background, uh, uh, you know, uh, back, background information. Um, and, and there's just a different inductive logic we should apply, but, but isn't an alternative just to, to, to shrug and say, we have no experience with things we know to be infinite sets of data. These chance functions aren't merely not probabilities, but maybe they're just not well-defined at all. Uh, you know, even in the example toward the end where you're like, we're trying to help explain to a, a, a couple of English majors what it means that their child has a, a 0.5 chance of being of being a girl. What we do is we we analogize with the benchmarking idea is you analogize it to something that they do have familiarity with a coin. But a coin is a, a finite system. Um, we're trying in in I think your talk to 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 make a connection between uh, you know uh, an eternally inflating multiverse and an infinite lottery, but both of them are systems that are, we don't have direct empirical access to. Uh, you gave as an example, well, someone who's skeptical of all this would just say, why don't we just set up a bunch of a large but finite number of copies of these infinite lottery machines? But of course, we can't do that. We, we don't have any empirical access. We can't do a simulation, even a simulation of a truly infinite case system. So how do I know that the right conclusion to draw from this is that this is just an example of whereof you cannot speak, thereof we should be silent? Um. Very nice. Um, I'll, I'll just reflect. I'm, I'm seeing you go through the torments of someone trying to figure out, well, how do we deal with probability? Um, uh, the, the remedy is one that, that, I, that, is, that is worse than the problem. 
because if what you say is right, then we're going to have to give up probabilistic analysis of infinite systems. And most of the problems that we deal with in physics just automatically have infinities attached to them. Uh, so, um, you know, cosmology is going to get to be rather messy. I'm not even sure if we can do gas theory because we have continuous distributions of probabilities, right? Which, you know, which are actually assigning uh, probabilities to infinite, infinite sets of intervals. Um, so, so that was the first point. Sorry, I'll try not to go on too long. That was the first point. Uh, second point, uh, the problems, re I, I go to these cases because it's, it's easy to see what the background facts are that fix the problem. Um, in finite cases, it's, it's, it's harder to get clean examples, uh, but there is a literature in finite cases that, that's equally troubling. This is the literature, literature of counterexamples to the principle of indifference, right? Um, I'm sure you've, you've, you've seen it. Um, um, the classic example is von Mises' wine water example. So we have a mixture of wine and water somewhere between a half uh, ratio of of, of, of one to two and, 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 um, and three to two. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you try and assign probabilities uniformly over the ratio of wine to water, uh, you get a different result than if you try and assign it over the ratio of water to wine. Now, the standard analysis of this is, is that, oh, well, the principle of indifference is a bad principle because it contradicts the probability analysis. Um, well, my answer to that is no, that isn't the way to think about it. Uh, the principle of indifference, when phrased correctly, is a completely benign truism of evidence. It just says, if you have no reason to distinguish two cases, you shouldn't, right? Uh, and uh, the wine water example is set up uh, just like that. Uh, and then finally, I, I agree with you, it is kind of fanciful to imagine setting up all sorts of things like this. There's another example where probabilities don't apply. You've probably come, come across this dome example where you have indeterminism as to the time at which the, the thing is going to move. Well, well, Rishi David has been very persistent in insisting that the correct way to analyze that is to imagine that you have a very large collection of these domes and you see what happens. Now, he knows, and I know, and we all point out to him that it's physically impossible to have one of these domes because they contradict quantum mechanics. So, you know, you're, you're not going to, nonetheless, he insists this is, the, this is the way to think about it. In some fictional universe, you imagine you have an infinity of domes and you see when the ball starts to move. And so, yeah, um, you're being very prudent in the way that I think most people aren't. Your, your dome was one of my final projects last semester, so. Oh, is that right? <laughs> but just, uh, just a quick follow-up to that. I think there's there's two points that that I I, so I was anticipating some of some of your response here, which is of course excellent. Um, but I have, I have two quick follow-ups. One is, um, in all the other cases, the truth is we don't know a priori exactly how to do probability, so we do experiments, right? I mean, the theory of statistical mechanics wasn't just people sitting in armchairs. And just positing out of whole cloth, whole theories of probabilities, and then we were done, right? Pe people made guesses, they did experiments, and then sometimes they were right, sometimes they were wrong. They were wrong about, you know, the Gibbs, you know, mixing paradox. That was wrong. They had to change how they were thinking about probability. We had to actually do experiments, and and often our our guesses weren't correct. Uh, we don't have access to that in this case. The second thing is in all those other examples where we use infinities in physics, the use of infinities may or may not just be a coarse graining assumption, right? Like there's a, a lot of very viable arguments. We don't know if they're correct. Obviously they're, 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 they're hypothetical at this point that, that maybe the infinities we're seeing in quantum field theory and statistical mechanics aren't really infinities. They're not really any more infinite than the continuous infinities we have when we model a Newtonian solid as an infinitely continuous object, right? It's, it's just a coarse graining assumption. Um, in this case of eternal inflation or an infinite lottery, we are stuck with a true infinity, like a, an actual infinity that isn't just the result of some potential coarse grading assumption. So I think that's also a qualitative difference here, right? We're not taking something that could be finite and using an infinity just for convenience. And then maybe taking certain results, you know, if you, if you, if you have an object that has a finite number of, 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 of physical, uh, you know, pieces to it, like a, a body that's made out of atoms, you know, and you, there is sort of a canonical way to think of it as a finite number of chunks of things. And then we just sort of take a smooth you know, limit and then we, we pour it over certain assumptions about what should happen in the finite case. And sometimes we're right and sometimes we're wrong. In this case, we don't have a clear finite 
thing for which this is a you know an infinite idealization. We're really saying that this is truly infinite, and I think that's novel. I don't know of any other examples in physics that we know where we've done that. So I don't know how we would acquire experience for how such a system should behave. Um, I understand the, 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 the question, but we do seem to find uh, empirical access to infinite systems. This is all of cosmology, right? Um, it's the idea that cosmologists aren't really talking about the universe as a whole. Um, second, second concern, uh, I'll repeat again what I said earlier, the issues with non-probabilistic systems uh, is not solely confined to infinite systems. These are only places where it's easy, uh, where it's uh, e easy to, uh, uh, to see them. Um, uh, I'm not sure what else to say other than... I'll, I'll close my question, but I just want to say that, you know, of course, in cosmology, we have access only to the observable universe. Uh, we have access to finite amounts of data about our, our universe. We can't see infinitely far. So, you know, again, we, we often take large things to be infinite as a coarse graining approximation, but, you know, once you start talking about eternally inflating multiverses, you're dealing with something that I think is not just a proc, well, anyway, I, I don't want to monopolize this. No, this I, I, um, two points then to say to that. Um, uh, we routinely make assumptions uh, about infinite systems on the basis of finite samples. Um, a lot of conjectures in number theory are believed to be uh, correct. Uh, um, uh, something like the Goldbach conjecture, right? Never, never proved, but but we've we've looked at finite samples and we think that gives us a license. So I'm a little nervous about your idea that we can uh, that we can never know about infinities. Uh, uh, perhaps we can never know deductively in the sense that we've checked every one, uh, but there are other ways, and 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 that works uh, uh, that works pretty well. Um, uh, and and, that, and then second, in effect, you're impugning eternal inflation as not properly scientific because it's not properly grounded in, empirically. Um, if that's your complaint, I'm very sympathetic. Uh, um, I don't know. It could be true. I just don't know that probability is the right frame. <laughs> For it, but whatever. Well, no, your, your, your objection is uh, when we're dealing with infinite systems, we can't know about them empirically, right? And so you're saying, therefore, if probabilities have trouble there, um, you, you know, it, it, it's not my problem. But uh, that complaint then applies to the entirety of the theory. So, so everything in, in inflationary cosmology then has to be disparaged as being, well, it's not properly grounded because we only can see a little finite chunk. Um, um, I, I mean, Setting aside this particular example, um, uh, my sense is that the density of speculation in inflationary cosmology is pretty high in comparison to the empirical grounding. Um, if your intuitions are empiricist, uh, so are mine. Uh, I'm, I'm much more excited by the current empirical investigations uh, in cosmology that are based on measurements of the cosmic background radiation. Um, you know, I'm eagerly, eagerly waiting to see what the uh, what the new telescope is, the Webb telescope is going to give us. Um, I absolutely delighted in the LIGO experiments when, for the first time, right, we accessed a channel uh, of, of a gravitational waves. So that you know, um, if you, I, I write in different areas, but if you look in my other areas of philosophy of science. It's a heavily empiricist inclination. And I complain a lot about metaphysicians who, who simply don't have that empirical grounding. So I'm, you know, um, I share your empiricist uh, concerns. Um, I don't think they're the ones to be applied here because we're asking uh, what concepts of, call, of, of, of uncertainty are out there. So maybe this is the, this is the, what, this is the one thought. My experience in many of these discussions is that I talk to people who find the idea that something is not probabilistic to be unthinkable, right? Um, um, and I'm trying to say, no, it is thinkable. And let me show, let me show you how. Uh, and remember, I'm a philosopher. I'm not a, I'm not a cosmologist. I'm not trying to do empirical science. I'm trying to do philosophy. Yeah. And I want that unthinkable. I want, to, I want us to realize that it's not some kind of a logical necessity that all indefinites have to be represented probabilistically, which is the default. Right. It is entirely thinkable that there are other ways of doing it. Yeah, I think you may know I feel exactly the same way. But good, thank you. This is very helpful. Thanks so much and a great talk. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Daniele. Hi, Daniel. Good to see you. Hi, John. 
Uh, so I have a number of comments. I have, I have to state uh, that uh, neither an expert in probability theory nor in uh, eternal inflation. So maybe a number of things I'm going to say are, are just naive. But so the part of what you said, uh, I, I would understand it as uh, showing how uh, a frequentist uh, definition of probability is uh, uh, troubleful in, uh, in, in this case on the one hand. And I'm, I'm guessing that that's why a lot of people would prefer uh, you know, to go for other definitions of probabilities, um, like more subjective ones. Especially if you think of uh, in, in a cosmological context, you can think of it as a, as a, as a lottery, but in which uh, uh, you, can, you can actually extract only one number. And you're asking, what's the probability that the number I extract uh, once and for all is a particular one of, a, of an infinite set? Um, so it has more to do with that type of situation in my understanding of just a single shot uh, uh, cases. Um, and that's exactly the case in which a frequentist uh, approach in which you just count uh, you know, relative frequencies is probably not the, the right one. A number of other things that you, that you mentioned seems to be just the correct illustrations of how uh, probabilistic reasoning, uh, uh, even when it's correct uh, in, in the case of infinite uh, cases uh, can lead to a lot of counterintuitive uh, results. Which, in itself, it's uh, it's is certainly fine, but uh, in my understanding, it doesn't prove uh, neither that probabilistic reason fails uh, or that uh, these results are incorrect. Uh, they are just highly counterintuitive. Uh, Third, one other comment is that, uh, again, for what I understand from people who do probability theory, I mean, uh, um, you, your examples come from counting in an infinite set, but uh, the infinity is best dealt in terms of uh, uh, probability measures. And uh, you know, all measure theory as a generalization of counting measures uh, is exactly what, what is used to deal with this type of uh, infinite situation, especially when the normalization is, cannot be just given by relative frequencies. And uh, so, for example, I don't think that Good was saying that it's a big deal uh, conceptually, the fact that you have to divide two infinities, because that's what always happens whenever you have, uh, you know, some uh, infinite and uh, maybe even continuous set of uh, uh, configuration data, um, and that you have to define some measure on it, and then you want to normalize it. You don't separately define the numerator and the denominator. Uh, because that will, in fact, give you, you know, uh, the, the necessity to divide to infinities, but uh, you do a more sophisticated uh, measure theory analysis. But my main point is, 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 is the following. My understanding of what is problematic about uh, um, eternal inflation has nothing to do with, inf with infinity or the possibilities. It has to do with uh, uh, one assumption you also make in all your examples, which is... Uh, uh, that you have a uniform measure, uh, which in fact, from the purely epistemic point of view, is, is the counterpart of total ignorance. And in the eternal inflation case, it is in fact interpreted by many to be just a total ignorance about what the right theory is. Uh, the theory that will tell you which of the infinite possible universes is more likely than another. So the fact that we resort to just uh, checking how many universes with the right properties in the set of possible universes uh, uh, exist uh, is the, the, the result of we having no clue from the theory about uh, what the probability measure should be that may favor some particular type of universe over another. And then we resort to just uh, trying to count relative frequencies. Uh, and it's the same, for example, with the, the string landscape. The problem is not in itself the, the large number, possibly infinite number of uh, uh, configurations that we have to deal with. It's the fact that the theory doesn't give us a, a probability measure to, to, to compute things in such a large space of possibilities. And that's exactly what dynamical theories usually give us. I know you have a dynamical law that will for given initial condition will tell you that one or a subset of outcomes is more likely than another. Uh, and in, in both eternal inflation and the string landscape uh, context, we simply don't have that. And that's the problematic aspect. That's why I think people would argue 
predictions are impossible, not because of the infinity, but because predictions on the basis of which theory giving you a particular probability measure. So you just are totally ignorant about how to deal with this infinite set of possibilities. Thank you. Um, I counted four questions there, so it's, I'll do my best to wind back through. Um, the final question number four was the one that you said was your main point. So let me see if I got this correctly. Uh, you're saying that the assumption that I've proceeded with from Guth is that we're looking for some sort of uniform measure which represents total ignorance. Um, and um, this is not an appropriate way to proceed because um, if you know more about it, there's a probability there and the job is to find it. Right. So what, what's all this talk about? Why, you, why am I bothering uh, with all of this when you know, more serious investigation is going to find, uh, is going to find the, the, the true probability measure that, that's there? Is that, is, am I, I getting I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have, yeah, you would, I mean, uh, you're getting right in the sense that indeed the problem is with the probability measure not being known. No? But I would not say that uh, uh, no. Without that, we can, we shouldn't think about the situation that is worthless. I'm just saying that, uh, for what I understand, the criticism against the thermal inflation from the physics point of view uh, is not is not related to the infinity of the possible universes that the theory would uh, say are possible, but with the fact that there's no guidance about how to evaluate probabilities in terms of uh, you know deciding what is the probability measure. To, to use. And that's the criticism against the theory, not against what you said about uh, using the, in the case in which you use the uniform measure. It could be that that's the right measure, but the theory doesn't tell us. You, now, okay, um, you might be right that further investigation into this is going to give us a probability measure. Uh, what I'm hearing, though, is a view that's so very common, and that is whenever there's a, an uncertainty somewhere, Ultimately, it has to be probabilistic. And if you can't see it, you just haven't looked hard enough. Well, I'm raising the possibility that uh, maybe it just isn't probabilistic. Uh, you can keep looking and maybe you just aren't going to find it. Um, this is why uh, uh, that, that might be the case. Now, look, I, I don't do cosmology. You know, I'm not an expert on that material. I just read the literature. That this might be the case seems to me to be indicated by the fact that you know this debate's been going for it was active for about maybe a decade, a dozen years, and has kind of kind of faded out. Uh, the fact that no one's been able to find that right probability measure is an indication that isn't there to be found. So that, that's the first point. Don't make that assumption. I'm 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 saying I understand you know that many people do make that assumption. It's the working hypothesis, but I, I'm suggesting it might be false. And now, I'm, now I've got a second suggestion. Let's put ourselves in a position that we are, you know, where the problem is posed as Guth has posed it and, and people in the literature have picked it up, right? Um, and then I'm going to ask, what is the appropriate represent, representation for the uncertainty that's, uh, that's involved there? And I'm simply saying, you get this funny logic, right? Um, um, you're free to imagine it's a nuisance, it'll go away, right? If only we, we dug deeper, but that depends upon this presumption, right? That, um, um, you know, that all uncertainty is always gonna come out to be probabilistic. So you asked four questions, that's my answer to the fourth one. I don't know if you like it or not. Uh, let, me go, let me go through the other three. Um, uh, you, you were uncomfortable with the frequentist talk. I only introduced frequentist talk because that's the response that I've heard from people. Um, you like the idea of, of you're saying we, we just have the one case, so there are no frequencies. Yes, I agree. That's exactly right. Um, and so you want to go subjective. Uh, um, why do you think that subjective credences have to be probabilities? Um, this is, uh, I don't think there's any good basis for insisting that subjective credences always have to be probabilities. I don't, I don't say this lightly. Um, that's what I discuss in the book. There are numerous arguments to the effect that credences have to be probabilistic. Dutch book arguments, representation theorems, accuracy measures. I mean, I, this is a big literature. I've done my best to, uh, to understand it. And it's very clear that every single argument is circular. 
right? And the proof of it is, is, is extremely simple. Once you start asking why not, it becomes very easy to see why not. They're all proofs. They all use deductive argumentation. They can't use inductive argumentation on pain of circularity. So they're all deductive. They, and, and so the conclusion is credences must be um, probabilistic. Deductive arguments need premises. And it's a matter of simple logic that the premises have to be logically at least as strong as the conclusion. And once you realize that, it becomes a completely foregone conclusion if you take any demonstration of the necessity of probabil probabilistic subjective probabilities. You can just go back to the assumptions that we used and find where uh, the probabilities were smuggled in as, as, as an assumption. And I do this in the book over and over again. Um, um, second, um, um, I only got this one. Something about, you said, infinities are counterintuitive. Um, so this doesn't prove the probability fails. Well, if, if there was a fallacy in my argumentation, tell me what it was. I think I was handling them carefully, right? Um, uh, now, then you said, oh, we know how to handle infinite systems uh, and you use measure theory, right? Well, measure theory, uh, uh, you, know, in, you, know, you know the definition of measure space as well as, as, well as we all do. Uh, we're, in the, we're in the uncountably infinite case. Right uh, with uh, with measure theory and traditionally the, the the sort of problems that I'm dealing with come up specifically in the countably uh, infinite cases. This is where countable additivity is seen to fail. Right, um, so you know I, I I don't think jumping to a a, a higher um, a higher infinity is is going to help with the lower problems. They can be defined perfectly well there. So okay, I I long questions four parts. Long answer. I'm sure I've said enough. I hope at this point. Count as an answer. Very, very much so. Yes. Thank you. Sure. Eric. Hi, Eric. Hi, John. How are you doing? It, 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 it was a, a a very lovely and clear talk as always. Thank you. I I, I have two, what I think are very simple questions. Um, the the first is if I understood. The logic that um, you know, that you sketched is it anything different than than simple ordinal ranking? And this um, the second question is very is actually very closely related to Daniele's. I think what was his fourth main question, which is that so I'm, I'm not assuming that there must be a probability there, but I'm rather just um, asking: Is it possible to generalize your logic so that you allow for weightings because there, there are there. There often are theoretical reasons to think that some parameter ranges are to be preferred in some sense over others, maybe for entropic reasons, maybe for conservation law reasons, or who knows what. But it, so, is there is there a way to generalize the, the logic you're talking about so that you can accommodate the idea that some ranges are preferred over others? Sure, easy questions. First, if by ordinal you mean all, all at best, what you're going to get out of this is something like a ranking. Yeah, that's yeah. what you saw. Um, uh, second, is it possible to generalize? Sure, always. Um, I wouldn't call it generalizing, I'd call it narrowing it down. And how do you do it? Well, material theory of induction tells you how to do it. Get more facts. Get more facts and, and you're in business. I wanted a definition or, or the, you know, a, a set of axioms or something like that, or you know, how, how, however it is that, that, that your favorite way is to define a logic. I, I would like to, to see I've got a whole 16 chapter book on it. Um, and the answer is find the background facts that prevail in the circumstances you're interested in and read it off from that. They, that will tell you. But you saw one version of how that's done. I took, I took label independence to be the key um, uh, expression here of, of, uh, of the fact prevailing. And then I cranked the handle. So if you've got more, um, you've, got to, you've got to get more facts from, from somewhere. And when you've got them, they'll, they'll tell you what they are. I don't, you know, um, um, it, uh, that's of course been the problem in eternal inflation, um, exactly to identify appropriate facts that will, that will do the work. Um, I mean, we know roughly what happens if you, if you, you know, there are different measures, there's, there's a, a world line measure, right? And the world line measure then does give you a way of ranking stuff, but, the, but that's a disaster because everything, all the universes turn out to be vastly too young because, because the, the way that stuff is being spawned off is you keep kicking off more and more and more younger universes. So, so in, I think a natural measure comes out of that, but it, it's a disastrous result. It just tells you that, you know, uh, you know, that it's really unlikely, 
you know, that there'll be universes that have lasted 10 to the 10 years. Right? Thank, thank you. Uh, Aaron. Right, my question comes from Birmingham, England. Uh, thanks very much for an inspiring talk. I knew nothing about your work previously. Um, and I think there are connections with things I've thought about that I don't want to go into in any detail now. And I, I've challenged ideas about bagatelles and other things having probabilities. And uh, just thinking about a, a marble being dropped onto a sphere seems to me to raise all sorts of questions uh, that can't be answered in terms of numerical probability. But that's, that's just my personal history. I want to ask you uh, uh, whether you've thought about uh, biological evolution in, in relation to these probabilities. The, the reason why I ask this is that I've recently been thinking about how things come out of eggs. Uh, and, uh, or more precisely, how eggs produce the things that come out of them. And uh, I'm especially interested in the ways in which processes in eggs can produce spatial competences in birds and, and tortoises and all sorts of other animals that they could not possibly have acquired after coming out of the eggs. So there must be processes going on, chemical processes going on inside the eggs that are somehow assembling these competences. And then that raises questions about, well, how the hell does does that happen? And I think the answer has to be given in terms of evolutionary uh, processes which produced various solutions to biological problems. And your talk made me start wondering whether there are or are not probabilities involved in that space or whether it is just too rich to be usefully discussed in terms of probabilities in the way that I think most people I know about in philosophy of science and psychology and neuroscience think you always have to bring in probabilities and, and the fashions for neural nets is just one example of that. I don't, have you thought about the space of evolutionary trajectories and in particular developmental trajectories in, organism, in things like eggs? Yeah. No, it's a good question. I, I, I really haven't thought about that. Uh, two, two remarks. The first one, you talked about dropping a marble onto a sphere. Um, uh, have you seen the dome example? The which um, one? The, it's the dome. It's actually named after me for reasons. It's called oh. the Norton's Dome. Can I suggest no. if you look at that, you might well find uh, what you're looking for um, uh, to embellish that, that example. Uh, uh, a, a, a mass on a sphere doesn't do it, but if you have a, 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 an odd dome shape, you can get weird results. Um, for oh, first, Mark, um, I misheard. So it's D O M E. Uh, D O M E, yeah. Okay, I'll write that down to remind me, but that's okay. exactly the sort of thing that I've been talking about. So yeah, that might be useful. But the second thing, I haven't thought terribly much about uh, biological systems because they're so complicated. The one that I've thought a little bit about in the neighborhood is something like the stock market. Right. Um, the standard assumption is that movements on the stock market are probabilistically driven. Uh, for a long time, the idea was that we had a normal distribution, right? And uh, and uh, as a result, uh, once you fitted your normal distribution, uh, if you if you invested in such a way that um, that you were protected against any fluctuation up to six sigma, uh, you would be fine. So the six sigma people got together and invested a lot of money and then promptly lost it when a Six Sigma variation came along. And then you get people like, um, um, oh, who's the guy who does fractals and stuff? Um, um, I'm just blocking on his oh, name. I, I know the person. Yeah, you know, you know who he is. He, he comes along and he says, oh, it's because in practice, you actually have infinite variance in the distributions, right? And so you actually have these infinite variance distributions. Well, I'm willing to, to, to consider the following possibility that there is no repeatable distribution. Now, how do I get that? Well, it's a matter of thinking materially about this. Uh, in order to have a probability distribution such that past performance is going to predict future performance, you need to have sufficient constancy of the conditions producing the probability so that, so that the same probability distribution gets produced. And the one thing that seems to be happening in markets is that they aren't they aren't like that. <laughs> they just keep changing and changing and changing. So I could well imagine we might find, you know. So um, I wonder if in um, biological systems a similar thing might might be a play. Um, but that's all. Sorry, it's just random thoughts. That's all. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you. Yes, thank you. Me, 
You reminded me of a book published in the early 1970s uh, called Social Science as Sorcery. Yeah. Uh, I think the author's name was Andreski. But anyway, the title... Mandelbrot, <laughs> that's the name of it. Mandelbrot is, yeah, that's right. I always have trouble remembering his name. I heard him give a wonderful lecture in 1991. But anyway, that's... Just he, think he, almond bread. <laughs> almond, almond bread, that's what it is. Mandelbrot, <laughs> right, yeah. Well, um, thank you very much. I'll try to follow okay. those up. Thanks. Uh, John, before you started the talk, uh, uh, you said something that you um, expected some uh, odd reactions from the people because of what you were, you were going to, to present. So I'm curious, uh, um, did you present uh, uh, your results in front of a physicist uh, working exactly on this problem and yeah. what their reaction was? Yeah, um, I presented this, um, I don't know if you know the Seven Pines Symposium. Um, so I gave this as a talk at the Seven Pines Symposium in front of a group of, of philosophers and physicists. Um, um, uh, Bob Wald, Bob, Bill Un I think Bill Unruh was there, I can't remember exactly. And I, I talked to Bob Wald afterwards about it. And um, Eric won't be surprised by this, but, uh, but he agreed with the criticism of the probability measures. He thought I was exactly right on that, but he just couldn't, he just couldn't move on to the, to the infinite lottery logic. That was just one, one step uh, too far for him. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, but I, I, I've noticed this. Um, there is this idea that all uncertainties, all indefinites have to be handled probabilistically. It's an idea that, that I used to have, right? So it's, you know, I mean, there's, there's no greater uh, zealot against smoking than a reformed smoker, right? And so, you know, and, and um, you know, I just eventually realized it doesn't have to, it just doesn't have to be that way. Um, I'm, remember, I'm not a physicist, I'm a philosopher. I'm interested in foundational issues like this. I can afford to think unthinkable thoughts, even if they don't have empirical consequences. And that challenges a great deal of current neuroscience and psychology. Yeah, oh yeah, I know. But um, let's be open to the possibility that we're running into systems where probabilities just don't work. Um, now, I'm not suggesting that we just rampantly, you know, throw things out. I am suggesting we look carefully at the foundations. So um, the slogan that I've been using is, it's fine to use probabilities, but in each case, in principle, you have a positive obligation to demonstrate the background facts that authorize them. You cannot, you know, um, you cannot just assume by default that probabilities always apply. Uh, you get into all sorts of all sorts of trouble. If I uh, can, I can I give you some examples, some of my favorite examples because they're kind of fun. Um, so, so here's what here's um, here's an example of why there has to be something rather than nothing. Um, this is uh, uh, Van Inwagen, who's a metaphysician, who's, uh, who, who, who writes on this stuff. He says, let's just think antecedently uh, about what might be the case, right? Um, the universe might be this way or that way or that way, or there are many, many different ways the universe might be. But non-being, not being, just happens one way, right? <laughs> so now we're uncertain over which all the possibilities are. Right, so we distribute our probabilities uniformly, right, over all of these possibilities, right, and then we ask, where's the probability mass? Well, any even loosely uniform distribution, right, um, uh, is going to say that all the probability mass is inherited by the being side, right. Therefore, very probably there has to be something. Um, now, I, I will, now Van Inwagen did publish this as a paper, and he did put in the paper, um, I know there's something wrong with this, but I'd like someone to tell me what it is, right? Um, um, and we're all thinking, oh boy. Um, I, I call this the inductive disjunctive fallacy. It's applying probabilities where they don't belong. All you know is that you don't know, and that's as much as you can get. Now, you might think, oh, these, oh, these rotten philosophers, um, but of course, they're going to fall into these into these stupid things. But I've heard this argument in many other places. Now, you might have noticed at the moment that that it's become very fashionable uh, to suggest that we are living inside a computer simulation. Right? Well, if you unpack the arguments that are being used for that, you'll find it's based on the same fallacy. 
right? There are all these possibilities, right? Um, the world might be really as we see it, or the world might be um, simulated by some advanced intelligence. And in the scenario that I cook up, I can imagine many, 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 many more ways that, you know, that it can come from a computer simulation. Therefore, most probably we're a computer simulation. So that's, you know, that's the popular literature. How do you, you know, what are you going to do with, with, with the popular press? They're kind of, you know, of course, they're going to fall for silly bright things. Um, serious scientists wouldn't fall for this, would, would they? I think we can, we can agree with that. No serious physicist or cosmology is going to use an argument like that. Well, I was at a cosmology conference in 2008, and this is the argument that John Barrow presented. Um, he presented it as a test of your bona fides as an anthropic reasoner. Uh, he said, let's think about whether the universe is finite spatially or infinite spatially, right? Um, now, a finite universe can only have finitely many observers. An infinite universe can have infinitely many observers, right, under fairly benign assumptions. So if we don't know anything more other than that, then, and we distribute our probabilities as you would expect, some sort of uniform way, then very probably we're in the infinite universe. Now, he didn't pause to tell us why this was a flawed argument. He just told us this, this argument. Um, um, over and over again, I keep finding this presumption that any sort of indefiniteness, any sort of uncertainty has to be probabilistic, gets us into trouble. And I just want us to be open to the possibility that, uh, that this is not correct, right? That, um, um, and, and the, the, you know, the remedy is very simple. If you um, want to use a probability and you want to be safe, display the facts that authorize the probability, right? So um, uh, someone is going to be chosen randomly for the population to be, to be you know, to, uh, to, to win a huge amount of money and everyone has a ticket. How are we going to do this? Um, should I think that everyone has an equal probability of, of getting the money? Well, yes, because there's a randomizer that's doing the picking. Right. Um, uh, those of you who are in the philosophy world, um, if you are at a uh, uh, at a race course and you are averse to losing money, um, then you should distribute your credences probabilistically, lest there be a Dutch bookie around who's going to uh, make uh, uh, make 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 trouble uh, make trouble for you. Uh, but if you can't identify uh, any basis for the probabilities, don't use them. You're going to get into trouble. Right? So in all of the examples that I, that I deplored as not working well, there was no good basis for assigning probabilities to the uncertainties that we were dealing with. We don't know uh, which of all the many observers we might be in a universe that's spatially finite or spatially infinite, right? We don't know if the universe is spatially finite or spatially infinite. Stop there, that's all you know. You know don't, don't now spread probabilities over this or another example, I, I guess you've seen the doomsday argument. It's an argument that, um, you know, that the, the end of the world is coming very soon. Again, it's the same guy all over again. You're, you're applying a probability uh, where there's no basis for the probability. Um, um, you, you ought to be very suspicious when you have arguments that have very weak antecedent assumptions. There's a process. We don't know anything about the process other than it's been going for two years. How much longer should I expect the process to go? Right, that's all you know. That's the setup for the problem. Um, you wave probabilities around, and then you say, "Well, very probably, it's coming sooner rather than later." Right, and the little little warning should go up and say, "Wait a minute, you put nothing in, and you get something really strong out. Something go has gone wrong here." And my answer is yes. You have an artifact of an improperly applied logic. This was the wrong one to apply. So you get bogus results, you know? But are people swayed by this? I mean, I published, the argument I just gave, I published this, I don't know, 10 years ago. And uh, um, I can't tell you the number of people who are now changing their ways as a result, because I'm not sure there is anyone. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you.